Hi, everybody. The Woolsey Fire that swept through um, uh, s uh, tragically uh, this area um, uh, did w at least a part of it apparently started at Santa Susana. Wow. And I want to tell you that the, t the two, we've had two huge fires or series of fires in Northern California, um, oh, at which, which Jim and Mary Beth are familiar with from there. And in, in those cases, in both cases of these huge fires where, where many scores of people died and thousands of buildings were destroyed, we are 100% certain, with, with, without, my, without any uh, real doubt, that these fires were started by Pacific Gas and Electric because they did not maintain their, their poles. They did not clean the brush out from under their power lines. Uh, when a breeze comes, these poles fall over the wires fall down, the shorts happen, and, uh, and the fires start. And PG&E, which owns Diablo Canyon, which is I consider the number one threat to all of us here in Southern California, um, is going to be bankrupt as soon as po we possible. And we get, we're going to have to have a major statewide campaign to have that utility taken over by the public. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and those nuclear plants have to be shut as soon as possible as we succeeded, thank God, in shutting San Onofre. We haven't done, dealt with the waste yet, but at least we, we know that we can shut nuclear plants. There is a second major nuclear issue in Los Angeles, which is the partial ownership of the Palo Verde nuclear reactors in Arizona um, by the DWP. And, um, and you know, DWP is a public-owned utility. It has no business owning three nuclear reactors or, or part of them in Arizona. And, uh, and our rates would go down and our health would uh, uh, would go up if we can get those shut. So that's another major campaign that we here in Los Angeles can jump in on. Now, Denise is a major expert in, in this. She's got a, a slide presentation. Um, she's going to give us 15 minutes of talking about Santa Susana. I'm sure most of you are aware that it's a nuclear site. It was the site of one of the very first atomic reactor meltdowns in the entire world. That's not a distinction we're happy about. So Denise is um, uh, a, 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 in a leadership role at the Physicians for Res Social Responsibility, and the next 15 minutes are probably going to be among the most frightening uh, you'll ever see, but let's make sure that we understand that this is something we can do about. We know who owns this site. We know they have plenty of money. They should have cleaned it up. They shouldn't have been there in the first place, but they should have cleaned it up a long, long time ago. So Denise will give you the, the detail, and then I'll follow with some short comments. Santa Susana is a long, long, long storied, complicated, um, tragic, frustrating uh, battle that's gone on for years and years. And when I tell people that our organizations worked for the full cleanup for over 30 years, I, I can tell some of them are probably thinking, well, you're not very good at what you do. <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is we, we're up against very, very, very powerful moneyed interest. So I want to first say, I'm with Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles. We're the largest chapter of the national organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility. We were founded in um, 1980 by um, Dr. Richard Saxon and his wife Pauline Saxon mm -hmm. and uh, some other doctors. And our uh, primary mission was um, nuclear abolition, nuclear weapons. Doctors looking at nuclear weapons saying uh, there's no <coughs> meaningful medical response to nuclear war. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. And I'm going to be placing a lot of my ire and my, um, my outrage, really, for what's happened at the, on the Department of Toxic Substances Control, or DTSC, which is the state agency that oversees the cleanup. So, um, and I have with me Mikey Rincon, who's our policy researcher. Uh, Mikey worked with Dan Hirsch at Community Bridge the Gap. He was a student. Uh, analyzed a lot of the Boeing reports. Now he works with PSRLA, and we're thrilled to have Mikey um, uh, with us. So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background on Santa Susana, and again, I'm going to be uh, moving rather quickly uh, because it's a long story with not a lot of time. Can we turn the lights down so we can see? Them? Sure. Yes. yes. The Santa Susana Field Laboratory uh, began operations in the late 40s. Uh, it's in the hills above the Simi and the San Fernando Valleys. That location was chosen because at the time it was considered they were doing, they were going to be doing experimental uh, research and they wanted to pick a location that was away from populated areas. Now 
uh, over half a million people live within 10 miles of the site. So there's where the site is proper and you can see the cities that are adjacent to it. Next slide. A lot of people know about the 1959 partial nuclear meltdown that always gets the headlines, but it is not uh, the sole reason why there's nuclear contamination on the site. At one point, there were 10 nuclear reactors on the site. Several others had accidents. There was a hot laboratory where they would reprocess spent fuel that was shipped around from around the country. Uh, there was a, um, a plutonium and uranium carbide fabrication facilities on site. There was open air burning of radioactive waste. It's off of the map here. It's literally off the map. So you can see here um, that in this area for the nuclear area of the site, uh, there was a lot of different nuclear activities that went on. Spills, releases, and accidents led to some of the considerable contamination that we have now in the soil and the groundwater and in the <coughs> vegetation and surface water runoff. Next slide. Uh, in addition, over 30,000 rocket engine tests took place at the site, uh, and that is what has resulted in so much of the chemical contamination. I will say this again later on. One of my greatest concerns about the fire is less the radiation, frankly, than the chemicals because of how much of the chemically contaminated parts of the site burned. So we're talking about trichloroethylene, perchlorate, dioxins, lead, mercury, some exotic compounds. Um, monomethylhydrazine is a big driver of some risks. Um, and uh, so that's what's contributed to some of this uh, chemical contamination. Uh, and I just mentioned some of the chemicals of concern that we have on the site for, radi for radionuclides. We're talking about strontium-90, cesium-137, plutonium-239, uh, tritium uh, chemicals. I, I just went through some of those lists. And again, these activities went on for decades. Uh, so it is, the site is heavily contaminated throughout the entire 2,800 foot, uh, 2,800, 800 acre property. Just to give you a sense of who, who owns the site, who's responsible for cleaning it up. The uh, Department of Energy is in Area 4 there. That's where most of the nuclear contamination, most of the nuclear activities occurred. In addition, you'll see where it says buffer zone. Uh, Brandeis Bardeen, which is a, a Jewish um, camp and children's camp um, that's located just over that hill, sued um, Boeing for contamination and uh, as a result, um, Boeing uh, bought some of that property there and calls it a buffer zone. Um, NASA owns uh, two small parts of the site. Um, Department of Energy leases from Boeing. So I should say that only owners are Boeing and NASA to a small degree. Department of Energy leases from Boeing. Boeing owns by far the largest part, uh, portion of the site, most of the site. Contamination's already migrated off site. Uh, so we have uh, findings in brandeis Bardeen area, in Runkle Canyon, uh, where there's a development now that we fought very hard and uh, lost the fight, and so there's um, homes there now. Um, in what's the Amundsen Ranch area, Bell Canyons uh, and uh, Dayton Canyon have all had contamination findings. Um, Runkle Canyon in particular is concerning because there was strontium-90 found there, and when it was, when they did the grading for the development, uh, a lot of residents were calling us very concerned about dust on their solar panels, and um, we know that we have a new pediatric cancer cluster in the area, and my, I, I could never prove this, but I'm very much worried that Runkle, the Runkle development had something to do with that. Just uh, so, some maps from a 2007 study that shows some of the off-site contamination. Uh, this is soil contamination, and you can see some of the um, nasty uh, uh, elements we have there. Uh, off-site wells or springs contamination. Here you'll see some of the uh, chemical contamination, vinyl chloride, very nasty, benzene, also very, very toxic. Uh, in terms of health studies, we have uh, studies of both the workers. UCLA did a study of the, uh, the workers' exposure to both radiation and to chemicals and found increased deaths for the workers who were exposed. We had another study of off-site populations by Dr. Hal Morgenstern, uh, who was at University of Michigan at the time. He used to be with UCLA. They found a 60% increase in certain kinds of cancers the closer one lived to the site. And we also had a study by a team led by Dr. Yoram Cohen at UCLA, which studied the potential for off-site migration. And it found that indeed contamination migrates off of the Santa Susana site uh, at levels that are over EPA levels of concern.
Um, we now have a pediatric cancer cluster that's emerging near the site. Uh, it's self-reported data. Uh, one of our um, fearless community leaders, Melissa Bumstead, uh, was in Children's Hospital and um, started to meet other people with rare cancers that live very near her. One woman said, I know you from the park. And she said, that's not possible. Childhood cancer is very rare. You can't, you can't live near me. And it turned out they did. And so she's mapped uh, 50 cancers that are rare childhood cancers that are near the site. That's her daughter, Grace, and her son, Luke. Um, that was Grace before she had her second um, uh, uh, experience with leukemia. And uh, she started a change.org petition that now has over 500,000 signatures. If you haven't signed it yet, please do. It's easy, change.org slash Santa Susanna. Um, uh, this is the second time we've had a uh, pediatric cancer cluster, the second time we've had people meet at Children's Hospital. Uh, in 2006, there was a, a group of mothers who all, whose children all had retinoblastoma, which is a rare eye cancer. There's less than 300 diagnosed in the United States a year. 11 were around Santa Susana. And they ended up suing Boeing and settled out of court and are not able to talk about it anymore. So very chilling for us in recent years to hear the same story happening again. Next What's slide. the site again? Change.org slash Santa Susanna. I'm going here now. Yep. Uh, in addition, um, in terms of more recent findings, some of those other, other uh, studies I showed were a few years back. This is from 2015, and I want to call out Mikey Rincon again for being part of the team that uh, worked with Dan Hurst to discover some incredibly <coughs> high risks in Boeing's own um, reports, risk assessment reports. In some parts of the site, the estimated ca lifetime cancer risk is 96 out of 100 people would get cancer if they lived on the site. Um, after Boeing's cleanup, they say it would go down to five in 10. The EPA goal is one in a million. So that's how contaminated it is in certain parts of the site. And those are Boeing's numbers. This is just a comparison um, when we get to clean up standards, um, just to show you the difference between what the EPA would recommend with what Boeing is, is trying to, to um, accomplish. They wanted to at first do a suburban residential that they had manipulated to not really be that. You could see the difference. The blue is what, um, uh, the, the blue is Boeing and the purple is EPA. So you can see how much more contamination would be left on site. Next slide. And uh, this shows what they're going for now here, which is the, of all the radiation that's been detected, how much would get cleaned up. Now they're going for a recreational, which is almost no cleanup at all. Cleanup agreements in 2010, two of the, the Department of Energy and NASA said they would clean up their site to background levels of radiation. $40 million was spent on a background survey to find out what those levels were, what would be normally expected in the area, and the goal, the idea was to clean up above that. The agreement said they'd finish by 2017. Mm -hmm. Boeing wouldn't sign and has been continually pushing for this very, 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 very weak cleanup. Uh, the DTSC um, has reversed course as well. It's allowed DOE and NASA to break a lot of key parts of their cleanup agreements. Clearly, the site's not cleaned up. It hasn't even started. There was supposed to be a $15,000 a day fine. None of that's happened. Um, and the big problem we have, which I'll call our call to action at the end, is about DTSC's draft DIR for the cleanup, which includes proposals that would leave up to 90% of the contamination on site. Uh, we'll come back to that. Next slide. So on November 8th, um, I got a text from my friend Rick Wayman at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation saying, I heard about the fire at Rocket Dine. I'm so sorry. Let me know what I can do to help. I said, what? Um, and turned on the TV and I took photos. And so those top two photos are photos that I just took of the television. Mm -hmm. And that's Rocket Dine burning. Oh. And that's, uh, there's a, a video um, I, I sent it to Harvey. It's just, it's just chilling to watch this site, when you know what's there, to watch it go up in flames is, it was absolutely chilling. And then here are before and after um, photographs of the site, before it burned and after it burned, and that came from, um, I don't know what those acronyms are, but NICB, GIC, uh, pre and post disaster analysis. Where did the fire start? Cal Fire said, E and Street and Alpha Road. That is on the Santa Susana property. That is not near the property. It's driving me nuts. 
uh, it's driving me just nuts that all the media are staying near the rocket dying site. And I don't know if they're being careful, which I understand you want to be careful if they're just repeating each other. One person said it, so they feel the other one should say it. But if you look on a map, E Street and Alpha Road is on the Santa Susana Field Lab property. Somebody told me on Facebook that Stu Mandel uh, was flying over the site and saying that uh, radiation concerns were just rumors. So I got on Twitter because I didn't know how to contact him. I don't do Twitter, but I know PSR has an account, so I thought I'll try to contact him that way. And when I looked at his Twitter feed, I saw that. That's the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. E Street and Alpha Street's right over here. Uh, so. Unless there's some magical story that comes out afterwards that fire authorities are saying it's going to take a long time yet, I want them to be careful. They need to be. They need to do their job. This fire started at Santa Susana Field Laboratory. I, I was at Taft Evacuation Center because mm -hmm. I'm in Topanga and evacuated, and Henry Stern was there. Mm -hmm. People brought this concern yep. up, and he said that they want an independent investigation. Yep, and I got a, I got a letter from Henry Stern in, in the slideshow. Uh, so um, then it very soon after became reported that there had been an incident two minutes before the fire started at the Chatsworth substation. So the incident location near E Street and Alpha Road. Summary, the, uh, the tripping was out of the Chatsworth substation. Where's the Chatsworth substation? Next slide. It's right here. It's right here. So the fire started here. Here's the Chatsworth substation. That's the site of the partial nuclear meltdown. We believe from other fire maps that they fought very hard to keep the fire away from these buildings here, uh, but part of Area 4 burned, but the buildings apparently uh, did not. Um, this I found just <coughs> searching online to find out where the Chatsworth substation is, and this is from a CPUC uh, document that makes it very clear it's at Rocketdyne. Um, official reports, you've um, probably all have heard, uh, it's fine, everything's fine, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, NASA admits that they had significant damage. Boeing says over half of its properties burned. DOE said at first, we're no, none of our structures burned, then they had to walk it back a little bit and say, oh, some developed areas burned. But again, um, you'll see that my biggest um, ire is with DTSC. Ten hours after the release, they said they didn't believe there was any uh, risk. Um, if they could say that, then why couldn't they give us their data at that time? They re released two subsequent statements where they just threw in some more agency names and said the same thing. We know versus the emails that community members have gotten and that elected officials have gotten, they didn't even have the samples back from the lab when they made those assurances. Uh, they tested on site. Why would you do that? People don't live on site. You should be testing where people live. We know what's on site. And if you really found nothing on site, then what are you telling us? That all this contamination burned off and is now somewhere else? Uh, the greatest period of risk was during the fires. That's when the, when the material was being made aloft. Now we do have ash and soil and contamination concerns, but that is the critical period, and that's when they should have, they could have at least said, please take precautions, because we don't know yet, but they didn't. Um, they have now said they're going to be preparing a report, um, and we know this from um, other reporters that we're talking to, but it appears that that report still isn't going to include the measurements, the equipment that they use, the detection limits of the equipment, the kind of things that we really need so my guess is they're taking a, a little while longer to massage it because they can't say they were wrong, right? Uh, they can't. And they're also responsible for the contamination still being there. The Department of Public Health said it found no discernible radiation. That's not possible. And not even on another planet would it be possible. <laughs> we have radiation with, from you know, uh, the cosmos. We have uh, fallout still from uh, above ground nuclear weapons testing, natural elements that does not inspire confidence. Uh, but then the biggest irony was hearing Governor Brown say at a press conference that he was skeptical of the assurances denying risk. It's a big irony because, uh, and this is another, the backstory and the cleanup is, it was Brown's administration that killed the cleanup. So a lot of us just, our draws dropped when we heard him saying, oh, oh, this is a wake up call. Killed it, huh? Yep. No, Next. He asked how, how it was killed. How, how it was killed? Yeah. Lobbyist. Uh, what he did was he replaced that we had a really good project director at DTSC. And that project director um, helped us get the cleanup agreements. 
and Boeing didn't like it. If NASA and DOE were going to clean up the background, that wasn't going to make their cleanup look really, really bad. So um, they pulled strings, uh, and that project manager was replaced. We know this has happened before in Santa Susana history from DTSC insiders who've told us. Um, not everybody who works there is bad. Some people really want to do a good job, and we get information from them. Uh, but by, by placing new people in, in, those place, in those critical positions at DTSC, the cleanup very quickly began to unravel. Here's a letter um, that Henry Stern and Jesse Gabriel did send um, asking, saying that they wanted the detailed information, the summary of the monitoring equipment. I don't really want a summary. I want to know everything. Um, but still, it's good that they did this. And um, to my knowledge, they have not gotten a response yet. What are we doing about it? Well, as I said, we are very concerned. I'm very, very concerned uh, a lot about, I won't, be, uh, I won't be able to tell you people what they were exposed to during the fires. There's ear monitors there. I don't trust the agencies to tell us the truth. In terms of what's in ash and what might have migrated further in the vegetation, the soil that burned, to test for chemicals is very expensive, and you have to tell them what you want to test for. The list of chemicals at Santa Susana is long. In terms of radiation, however, we have some um, knights in silver armor, the, uh, uh, silver armor, which have stepped in, which is Arnie and Maggie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education. Those of you in the room who follow nuclear issues know Fairwinds really uh, came into the fore on the um, Fukushima meltdown. They've been doing uh, sampling there, looking for hot particles. These are things that um, the agencies aren't going to be looking for in, in dust and uh, from air filters in people's homes, from vacuum cleaner bags, um, even uh, from ash. And so they're going to help us look for radiation that's migrated from the site and we'll have some independent data. We won't know if it migrated before or after the fire, but we might have some information based off of the spatial clustering. Several groups have contacted them. Our organization is working with Parents versus SSFL um, to have a small sampling team. The protocol that um, Fairwinds released uh, intimidated some people. You have to be careful. We, you, you know, we want to be as rigorous as we can with chain of custody, with wearing a mask, with, with getting just the right amount. And so we have, we're now going to be offering a service of sending trained sampling teams to people's homes, uh, which is, again, not where the agencies are going to be. Um, and Mikey's part of uh, those sampling teams. Uh, we hope to have a press release out tomorrow or the next day with a link just being posted on Facebook. We have 150 people that have signed up. So uh, it takes a long time. It'll be four to five months. But we should get, and they're going for a peer-reviewed study to look for hot particles, radioactive particles that have migrated off of the San Susana site. And I, for one, um, am, am thrilled that we'll have that information and that they're, that they're going to partner with us on this. What's the Facebook page? Parents versus SSFL. Uh, and um, PSR, if, you, if you're if um, you on our list, or I can send it to, to, to Jan, uh, when we have our press release with the, the where you should go to sign up and all of that, I'll make sure everybody here gets that. Um, the call to action that we have right now is really about Gavin Newsom. We want, uh, we, we protested in front of his, actually there we are, in front of his campaign headquarters to deliver some of these petitions. We met with his chief of staff. We met with his chief of staff again in Sacramento. It's not going to be his chief of staff now that he's governor. But what we're asking them to do is to delay that EIR. If that EIR is finalized this year, it really bakes in, it codifies uh, some very poor choices for the cleanup. And yes, you can have a supplemental EIR, but we would rather not. We would rather this one get fixed so that we have some real, we actually have some cleanup options that are meaningful. But you are working, <coughs> Gavin is working with you in terms of um, uh, ways Williams in terms of working with the community? We've had conversations with him. I, we have, I have not gotten a response to my texts or emails from the last week about what's the status with the EIR. It doesn't mean that it, you know, they've got a lot going on. But yes, we are working with them. At the same time, uh, they're being told a whole different bunch of, uh, the last time I talked to Reese, he was like, well, they said the air monitors said there was nothing. And they, you know, they, there's a tendency still to believe the man. I'm just going to put it that way. So we still really, really want to, um, you know, whether you're tweeting, whether you're calling, whether you're emailing, they've got a, he's got something on his website, what's important to you, tell him the 
full cleanup of the Santa Susana field lab. Excellent, excellent. We want them to enforce the cleanup agreements and we really need that agency to be reformed. Um, when uh, the director, Barbara Lee, was at her confirmation hearing, Kevin DeLeon looked at her and he said, I want you to be a disruptor. I want you to be a disruptor. He knew the agency was broken. We're not the only community that's been let down by DTSC. You've heard about Exide all throughout the state, the same story. So we want that agency reformed. And here's, here are some resources. Protect Santa Susana from Boeing is my, my favorite because uh, uh, we, Boeing released a website called Protect Santa Susana trying to say that the cleanup was worse than the contamination. Big, big greenwashing campaign. So we built this one to sort of answer back. I like that. So it's gonna give you a lot of current information. Then you've got the groups that have asterisks there by them uh, all have sign up lists where you can sign up. Um, committee to Bridge the Gap, of course, um, are with a very, very close partnership with Dan Hirsch, Parents versus SSFL. Facebook group is very active. Enviro Reporter has been writing on, uh, covering this on for a long, long time. And full disclosure, it's my husband, Michael Collins, whose website that is. Um, and uh, NBC has done a, a great uh, multi-year investigation on it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.